Okay. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, this is my name. This is where you can get me on, on Twitter, at uh, Nix. I'm a uh, Rails developer, long-term Rails developer. I'm from Wellington in New Zealand, uh, and I'm now obviously living in London. Uh, I'm working on this. Uh, this is called Gelato.io. It's my startup. Uh, it's a tool for uh, re having really cool API documentation. So if you've got an API, you want to get some more developers onto it, you want to make your docs really cool, come and see me and I'll, and I'll get you in on the better of that. Uh, so you might have noticed that I have a bit of an accent. Uh, I'm not from here. Completely different to, to Aaron's accent, obviously. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we actually came the long way here. Uh, so we went th like this, and uh, all the way from Shanghai to London, we were actually on a train. So uh, apart from a little uh, sort of gap in the Baltic states where the EU is apparently still building the, the tracks, so it makes it hard to catch trains. Uh, so yeah, I feel like we, I know a decent amount about uh, trains and journeys, so I thought I would take you on a bit of a train journey today. Uh, so this is all about uh, the things I've learned um, and the problems I've encountered, and uh, things you can do when you're building something with uh, Ember.js. And so that's my uh, beautiful title slide. Uh, the alternate title for my presentation, can you tell I like titles, I've had three title slides, uh, is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Hamster. Speaking of which, uh, I'm obviously pretty new to Ember. I've only been doing it since about October last year. So I might get stuff wrong. In fact, I probably will get stuff wrong. If I do, uh, please let me know afterwards because that's how I learn new things. So like I said, we're going on a bit of a train journey. So I thought I'd use something that uh, you guys are probably all familiar with. But like, I really love the underground, but everybody here is like, this is the worst thing ever. Uh, so we've got five stops. Um, first off, we're going to talk about getting on the right train. Obviously, uh, pretty important. Then we're going to talk about getting set up. Uh, we're going to talk about some translation difficulties, uh, dealing with isolation and insanity, and uh, then the zen of Ember. So uh, the train is now ready to depart. Please mind the closing doors. Uh, so the first step of any successful train journey is obviously getting on the right train. So I was building my startup. Uh, I knew what I was going to build, and uh, I knew that this was the kind of UI I needed. This is what a modern web application looks like. It's got this dynamic, responsive UI, uh, and yeah. I also knew that there were a bunch of different ways I could get this, uh, heaps of different JavaScript frameworks. Uh, in fact, almost too many. Um, we kind of had this, uh, I had this sort of paradox of choice or this uh, analysis paralysis effect where, you know, there were so many good options, which one was I going to pick? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, it's not just about going fast. Uh, I love this here. Uh, so this and the slide I showed before is a picture from the Shanghai monorail. Uh, and I love the Shanghai monorail not just because it's the world's fastest regular commuter train and I got to fly at 430 kilometers an hour along magnets, uh, but also because it's a really, really awesome development metaphor. You see that the Shanghai monorail leaves from Shanghai Pudong Airport and goes to halfway to wherever you want to go, at which point you have to get off, get onto the regular, slow, crammed subway, and get into Shanghai proper. So it's a really good reminder that going fast is all well and good, but where are you ending up? What's the problem you're solving? What's going to matter to your customers? And what's going to make you money? So obviously, for me, I had my problem. I knew what I was building. I was building gelato.io. So I knew I needed this dynamic, responsive UI. I looked on the uh, Ember website, and lo and behold, the first words are, um, it's all for ambitious web applications. Great, that sounds like me. I'm definitely building an ambitious web application. Uh, I need to make sure that I'm pragmatic, not idealistic, because it's a startup. It's just me. I don't have a whole lot of money. I can't spend uh, three months spinning my wheels trying to get the right dependency injection framework going. And so there you go. The next line on the, uh, on the Ember.js homepage is more productive out of the box. Excellent. Sounds like me. Uh, and then the last thing is, well, basically I'm dumb. Uh, I need lots of hand-holding. I need to get up to speed. I need a nice, uh, easy ramp up. And so again, guides.ember.com is a really, really great resource. And there are a lot of tutorials out there and a really, really great community. So yes, great. Um, this actually happened after I picked uh, Ember as a language and it kind of reinforced my decision. Uh, I was initially uh, sort of worried about the Google ability of uh, Ember, if you'll excuse the terrible pun. Uh, but uh, then 
Yehuda started talking about this idea of stability without stagnation, which I really like. You know, I've got a business to, uh, to make customers, and I've got to make money. Uh, so I don't want to have to go rewrite everything just because some programmer somewhere decided that there was a slightly better version of Ivory Tower, and now I should have to write everything in a new language. This is what I was doing. This is what my JavaScript code used to look like. Admittedly, it would get a bit more uh, complex every so often, and it would start to become a CopyScript class. But effectively, what I was doing is I was um, listening for direct DOM events on DOM elements and going and updating uh, another DOM element or the same DOM element based on those. So it was kind of an if this, then that, or this, or do the other thing, You know, this kind of procedural uh, thinking. So this here, this is the handlebars you need to uh, give you that dynamic responsive UI example I showed you earlier. Uh, and this is when I, when I wrote this for the first time, this is when I knew that I had the right tool for my job. So it was much more declarative, much more about here's what you need to give me the UI I want, rather than in this case do this, but do this, but only if it's a, you know, if it's a rainy Tuesday and I'm wearing a blue t-shirt, do that. It's much more about uh, you know, declaring what your application looks like. All right, so great, we're on the right train. Uh, we want to get set up. This is a train in Vietnam. Uh, so I'm a pretty uh, stuck in my ways Rails developer. I, I knew what I wanted, I knew the tried and true. So what do you do when you want something new as a Rails developer? You go and find a gem. You go install the gem uh, and then so, of course, I ended up with Ember Rails. Now, Ember Rails is a, is a really nice gem. It's just a little bit kind of like a slow train, a little bit rickety. Uh, I had issues with getting the asset pipeline to work at all or in a performant way. Uh, I had deploy problems. The testing setup was either non-existent or I really couldn't work it out. Uh, and there was a distinct, like the main issue for me was that it was a lack of standardization. There was no obvious place for all of my components to go. There was no obvious place for all of my controllers to go. Uh, so what I did is I went along to the Ember London project nights, hint, hint, uh, and I think multiple someones uh, there suggested that I jump onto Ember CLI. Thank you for that. Uh, jumping onto Ember CLI is like getting onto one of these sweet bullet trains. These go at like 250 kilometers an hour and you wouldn't notice they're as smooth as butter. It's really cool. Um, Suddenly everything made sense, like everything had a place, uh, I knew I had my bearings, I had testing baked in, I even had an Ember command, uh, and this is brilliant coming from Rails because I was used to having that Rails command uh, to do everything for me, used, used to having the God command, so it was nice to be able to do Ember S, Ember G, uh, Ember test, and just have that working. First issue I ran into, uh, Ember CLI ships with its own server, and then you've obviously got your Rails server with Thin. Your, uh, the Ember CLI server runs by default on uh, port 4200, and your Rails server is running on port 3000. So you're technically uh, speaking cross-origin. So now you've got to go and set up all of the cross-origin resource sharing headers and do a whole bunch of really boring stuff to try and uh, actually get two apps that are both running on your local machine talking to one another. Uh, so I did this. I uh, just chucked in the rack reverse proxy gem and effectively just transparently proxied anything uh, beyond the slash app in, in my uh, Rails application, just transparently proxied that onto port 4200. So yay, as, uh, as far as they're concerned, they're both on the same host, no cause problems. Um, you only have to do that for development because it's just like a couple of lines of Nginx config to do that in production and you've got a nice compiled slug. So yeah, if anybody wants to steal that, I'll probably put the slides up. Uh, another thing that I really wish I'd kind of understood better when I got into Ember CLI was ES6 modules. Uh, Ember CLI makes really, really heavy use of these, and I just kind of thought, eh, I can figure it out. Uh, so this here is a uh, copy verbatim from this blog post by someone a lot smarter than me. Uh, he's one of the founders of Discourse. So you should go and read that blog post uh, if, you, if you're like me and you didn't, don't really get uh, ES6 modules. It's worth understanding. One of the things that, again, didn't seem to uh, penetrate for me was that, uh, was that the ES6 uh, resolver, oh sorry, the Ember CLI resolver does some clever things with the paths. So if you've got a mixin in app mixins, it will do your app name slash mixin slash super mixin. So you'll, your app will map, your app name will map onto the slash app folder. So Initially that's confusing, but then you're like, oh man, this is really cool. If I want to import something from my app, I just use my app's name. Uh, it works for Ember CLI add-ons as well. 
So if you happen to be using the Ember CLI accounting add-on, accounting JS add-on, so everybody say thanks to Miguel, uh, you can import functions from there just using the name of the add-on. So you can just do accounting slash format money. Really, really cool to have that resolver around to do all the path munging and all that rubbish for you. Uh, another sort of part of the Ember CLI story which I think is potentially a little bit undercooked or maybe still working on uh, is installing third-party libraries. I think I've managed to figure out a way that this works for mostly everything. So we'll see, we'll go through my sort of uh, flow chart and uh, we'll see what you all think. So the first thing I do if I want to install a third party thing is I check emberaddons.com, see if somebody's been really nice and made an Ember CLI shim for me. Uh, if there is, it's really easy to install it. Ember install add-on, name of the add-on, bam, you're done, job's done. Uh, there's no Ember add-on, okay. Well hopefully there's going to be an NPM package. Um, most modern things have an NPM package somewhere uh, and you can install that really easily, NPM install, whatever the library is called. Uh, don't forget the dash dash save dev, I had no idea what that meant initially uh, and then I realized that what that does is it persists your, uh, your third party library uh, version and everything to your package.json in a similar way to your gem file or kind of like a uh, cross between gem file and gem file.lock uh, and if you don't have that everything is going to break on production or on other people's machines because it's not going to have any of your dependencies. No npm package, uh, there might be a bower one. So for a bower package you can look on bower.io or I don't really like their search thing so I just look for a bower.json and to be fair most things have that. Um, installing a bower package is pretty easy, similar to installing an npm package. Uh, again don't forget that dash dash save dev. And uh, then the one other step you need to do is you need to make sure that Broccoli knows about it. So you need to pop it into your brockfile.js. Uh, normally in the Bower package there's an AMD or required JS compatible file that's been built in like a slash disk directory that's called like, you know, dist everything that's in this third party package.js. And you can just import that file and uh, Ember CLI will work its magic and so you can actually use it. Last resort, what if there's no Bower package? This is some like jQuery plugin that's been gathering dust on GitHub for six years. You still can use it with Ember CLI. You just slap it into uh, slash vendor and then same thing, you, use, uh, you import it in your Brock file. So just import vendor, your lib, whatever. Uh, you might also have to add it to JS Hint RC if it's a global like on window so that uh, your tests stop complaining. Uh, this is our mascot, he's a panda called Mr. Pung from Hong Kong, uh, sitting on one of those bullet trains kind of contemplating is what I was going for there, but as soon as you can't see his face it's hard to tell. Uh, one thing that I'm still like, kind of trying to work out uh, is asset sharing. So I have uh, the Rails app serves the login, logout forms, all that rubbish, uh, and the Ember app does the application itself. They obviously both have buttons, the buttons have the same CSS, I want to share them. Should I be serving that CSS through the asset pipeline with sprockets? Should I be serving that CSS through uh, Broccoli and through the Ember asset pipeline? How do I share those things around? Uh, and so I'm interested if somebody has a solution to that. Uh, maybe they can tell me about it and I can steal that. All right, third stop, uh, dealing with translation difficulties. Uh, so for those of you who don't read Cyrillic, this is a Starbucks coffee in Moscow. Um, it's fairly easy to uh, get your Rails app spitting out JSON that Ember can understand. Uh, most people tend to use Active Model serializers. Uh, they've recently embarked on like a pretty ambitious rewrite and I think that's sort of dovetailing in with the JSON API stuff. So my suggestion is to stick with the 08 stable tag for at least now. That's worked really well for me. Um, <coughs> this is the config you need to put into your serializer classes to have it generate JSON that Ember can understand. You need to tell it to embed IDs and include models. So this is the JSON that you get out basically. So if you have a developer and a developer has many meetups, uh, what will happen is because you've told it to include IDs, developer will end up with a meetup IDs uh, property, which is an array of IDs obviously. And because you've told it to include true, it will sideload the meetups for you, uh, which means that you get all the meetup information without having to do a second AJAX request. So that's really, really cool. Another problem I hit, uh, and this was kind of an issue of my own doing, uh, I decided that I was going to use these Instagram IDs, which are really, really cool. Uh, they are sort of these pseudo timestamp shard based unique IDs uh, that you can generate with a Postgres stored procedure. Uh, I won't talk too much about them because the blog post is really cool and it's uh, worth checking out. So basically the idea behind them is it's kind of the same as uh, UUIDs, you don't want to leak the information, you know, users slash 63 means that you've probably got 63 users if the next one is user 64. Uh, 
not entirely necessary, but kind of cool. Worth noting that they are 64-bit integers. Uh, and by default, Active Model Serializer will send them through in JSON as integers. And we all know that JavaScript does not deal with 64-bit integers very nicely. In fact, it uh, doesn't. Uh, and the 53-bit integer you get back instead, the, uh, su the supplementary integer, it looks sort of kind of like this. So initially, you're kind of thinking, huh, that's really weird. Why is that ID not found? And then you realize, oh, 64-bit. <laughs> Uh, so this is the monkey patch that I use for Active Model Serializer to get it to treat everything as a string ID. So it's pretty simple. It's Ruby, you know, monkey patch, bust open the class, tell it to treat everything as a string, close it back up again. Uh, if anybody wants that code, then more than welcome to steal it. Uh, JBuilder, I think a lot of people grab Active Model Serializers and they think, yeah, JBuilder, I don't need that. Uh, there's kind of a reason it's the default for, for Rails. It's a really good uh, declarative way of, of talking about uh, the JSON response from a particular action. And it's really good when you need to paint outside the lines slightly. You can do stuff with uh, a whole bunch of methods in your serializer and things like that, but I find that it gets really unwieldy really fast. And this also means you can access your uh, view helper logic. So if you have stuff for avatars or images or any of that kind of asset path stuff, asset pipeline stuff, you can access that in JBuilder. So definitely worth checking out. This is in New Zealand, by the way. Uh, you should all go and visit. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're contract bound to uh, pitch New Zealand to everybody who's not a Kiwi. They, and they sign it on our visa. Um, you kind of get this uncanny valley effect a little bit when you're going from uh, Rails to Ember in, in terms of the terminology. Uh, because they're both MVC frameworks, they tend to use the same terms, but things that are called the same don't necessarily have the same job or work the same across both frameworks. Model's nice, nice and easy. They're basically the same uh, across both frameworks. Control is a little bit hard. So the thing that does the job of retrieving model information from the database and then kind of pushing it up the stack with minimal processing in Rails, we call that a controller. In Ember, that's called a, a route. So, and this is extra confusing because in Ember, you also have controllers. Uh, but their controllers are closer to what Rails people would potentially call a view model, maybe. Uh, so in Rails, you have kind of the view helper, view model stack. And then in Ember, you have uh, components and template pairs, and they can be nested down and things like that. Uh, I just about put controllers in there, but Ember 2.0, controllers are going away, so I put component in there. So just imagine it says routable component. <laughs> Uh, another thing that really, really confused me, and again, it, it sounds uh, silly, but it, it was just uh, a bit of an aha moment when I finally figured it out, is the actual uh, definition of the routes. So in Rails, in your routes.rb, you say resources hamsters, you get those seven magic actions. You get the index, get, you know, update, all of that. In Ember, when you say that, you just get the collection routes. You don't get all of the edit and all of that guy. So you just get the tutorials uh, route and the tutorials index route. Uh, you also get the loading and error kind of substates, but you get those for everything. So if you kind of want a similar uh, routing call to what you've got in Rails, you need to uh, define each thing individually. So you can do that by just passing a closure to the second parameter of the resource call. So Seems obvious, but it's really confusing because the API is super similar. In Rails, it's called resources this, and it spits out a bunch of them. In Ember, resources this only spits out the, con uh, the collection ones, what we'd call index in uh, Rails land. Uh, dealing with isolation and insanity. Uh, so if you take this video and loop it for about three days, that's what riding a train through Siberia looks like. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't change much. Uh, this is Mr. Pung again. Uh, he's staring out at the Gobi Desert. Uh, and the testing story in Ember CLI sometimes feels a bit like this. Uh, they've kind of, uh, they've gone down this path of having each unit completely and utterly isolated from anything else. Uh, so they have this really cool needs functionality, but this is the actual needs array from one of my components. And you can see that it just gets crazy fast. And we're talking about a pretty small app. We're talking about something that, that I can bust out in four months. So it's not huge. Uh, so effectively, for those of you who haven't seen, has everybody seen the needs stuff before? Do I need to explain that? General nodding of heads. OK, I won't explain that. Um, so sometimes uh, this is me literally herding yaks in Mongolia. When there were yaks, I was like, I am going to chase these yaks and take a photo of it so that I can use it in some tech presentation at some point. <laughs> um, 
I, they, they're pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be doing well to get close enough to shave one. Uh, and they jump as well. They like jump over the little ditches and everything. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, sometimes it felt a bit like yak herding, uh, yeah. testing. What's that? <laughs> Uh, sometimes it was a bit like yak herding uh, going through and writing tests in Ember CLI because you would have to go through and uh, if you had a CSRF service that was uh, generating, getting your Rails CSRF token, you'd have to fake that out for your component test. If you had uh, a, a, an Ember data store, a DS store, you'd have to fake that out. If you had models coming out of the store, you'd have to fake those out. And so you end up building this whole like house of cards around before you actually uh, can test the bloody thing that you're trying to test. Uh, as you can tell, it drove me a little bit nuts. Fortunately, that has changed. Yes. Uh, so uh, this landed this morning, actually. Uh, I jumped on IRC. I chatted to Robert Jackson. It turned out that the thing I wanted needs going away uh, was like 90% done. And he pointed me to the last 10%. I got it done, and we landed it. So you can now just specify integration true. And that means you get to decide what subset of your application you want to test at any point in time. So. Thank you, uh, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Jamie, for uh, steering me in the right direction and everything. Uh, it's actually really, really, really easy to pitch in on this stuff, and I love this RFC process. Uh, I mean, obviously, the one sign of a healthy open source project is that they encourage and welcome contributions. A, a further sign of a super healthy open source project is that there's a transparent and easy process to go through in order to get those contributions accepted. So this is really, really cool. Uh, in order not to go insane when you're in a very confined space for four days and you can't leave, you need to remember to clean up after yourself. Um, so again, we're Rails developers. We're used to each request being largely idempotent. We're used to getting a brand new clean slate every time somebody does a get or a post or a put or whatever. Don't work that way in Emberland. You are going to be in this browser environment for a while. Those transitions that Aaron was talking about are not getting you a whole new browser environment. So you best be tidy. Uh, if you're going to do something like this inside a component, so here we go, I've got a component. What I'm doing is uh, when I'm inserting the, when the component's inserted into the page, I'm saying uh, I want to do this stuff when the window is resized. So I'm listening to a, uh, a jQuery event outside of the component element uh, when, the, when the component's inserted. If you're going to do that, you've got to do this as well. Uh, so when you're destroying the element, you've got to go and unbind that resize listener because obviously Ember can't do that for you. Ember doesn't even know about it. Destroying the component's not going to do it by default because your listener's on window. So you've got to remember to do that. Uh, otherwise, this is what happens. Somebody decides to resize the window in your app and you end up with like 358 exceptions in your ray gun and your email inbox is screaming at you. So yeah, make sure you do that. Uh, this error message. Uh, Cannot, uh, coming from one of your handlebars templates, cannot read property description of undefined. This one had me tearing what little hair I have left out. It was so frustrating. It's like double rainbow, what the f does it mean? Um, what this means, well, can anybody spot the bug? Yeah, see, exactly. It's really tough to spot. Yeah, bam. <laughs> <laughs> it's the wrong freaking closing tag. So, like, I was going to say this seems dumb, but a heap of smart people are like, huh, what's the, <laughs> what's the issue? So, yeah, if you see this, cannot read property description of undefined, and it's coming from one of your templates, and you don't even have a property called description, you've never thought about description or, like, told Ember about it at all, that's what's happening. You've nested the bloody things wrong. Uh, yeah, so I'm probably going to try and land a patch to make that say you're a dumbass and you nested things wrong. Um, heaps of really good resources. We've already talked about the forums tonight. Uh, this is Jamie and Aaron helping me out. Thanks, guys. It's really, really good to go on there. And uh, the best part is if they help you out and it's useful, you can go and buy them a beer at the pub really soon. Uh, there's also this guy called Chris Ball who's made a really cool resource called from rails to ember.com. It covers a bunch of what I talked about uh, tonight and a heap more stuff, so definitely worth checking out. There's a mailing list on there, so you can just get emails. Uh, last but not least, uh, the way of the hamster. Uh, so again, being kind of a stuck in the mud Rails developer, I was writing everything in CoffeeScript because that's what you do in Rails land and uh, you, know, you abide by the rules of DHH. Um, 
Ember seems to be a bit more on the ES6 side of things, so I went ahead and uh, drank the ES6 decaf Kool-Aid. Uh, so you still get all of the really nice things that you want from CoffeeScript in ES, ES6. Uh, you get, if you've got those uh, fat arrow functions, the, the lexical this functions, you can do the same thing. You just need to add a few more special characters. You actually do need to have those, uh, those method parentheses at the front there, unfortunately. Um, you've also got string interpolation. In ES6, they're called template strings. All you've got to do is replace those double quotes with back ticks and uh, swap out your hash for a dollar sign, and you've got string uh, interpolation. Awesome. There is a ton more to ES6 that, is not, that does not even count as making a scratch on the surface. Uh, Babel is the new name for uh, five, six to five. Six to five. Um, that is the JavaScript transpiler, uh, and they've got a really good learn ES6 section, so I suggest you check that out and uh, learn it. Uh, computed properties and the Ember object model. So computer properties are kind of like an Ember object superpower. They're really, really cool. Uh, so just a couple of them that came uh, to mind when I was writing this. Uh, alias, so you can get a, a two-way binding, which means that uh, if I update API resource or resource, they'll both stay in sync. Really, really cool if you're like me and you like to say a bit of typing. Um, you can use it for, for like a default value. So if you want a one-way binding, um, that's really cool. And you can also do these kind of innumerable style um, properties where they'll go through. And so that changes made Boolean will be true if any of the uh, properties in the parameter list are true. So that's really, really cool as well. And you can extend that out. So you can observe uh, any of the uh, elements of an innumerable. So here I have a model. The model is a meetup. Meetup has many talks. And uh, this computed property will go and set that talks changed Boolean to true if any of the uh, dirty booleans on any of the talks change. So that's really, really useful when you have a belongs to and you want to set the, uh, the dirty property on the parent model. Again, turns out that uh, there's lots of help around. So guys at image.js.com has a whole object model section, and it's definitely worth at least skimming through that. There's a ton more of those computed property macros, and they're all super, super useful. Initially, I was kind of treating uh, handlebars a bit like ERB. So I was thinking about it in a procedural way. I was doing these ifs. And if you try and treat handlebars like ERB, you're going to have a bad time because it's not like ERB at all. Uh, this is how you should do that. So here in my model, I just add a computed property called display title. And what that does is that goes and sets the title to unnamed if the title is um, if the title is blank, otherwise it returns the, the model title. And because I've got uh, title as the first parameter to the computed property there, it'll update every time the model's title updates. And I can just do that in, in one quick handlebars tag. Brilliant. Uh, this is really nice. I've got my domain concept represented in my model. It's in a testable, reusable kind of way. And it's more declarative and less procedural. So I'm actually talking about here's what this looks like rather than here's how this behaves. Uh, Another really stupid thing that nobody told me, but I wish I'd learned earlier, is that you don't have to do get, 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 get. You, you can just chain them on. Hey, like I'm, uh, I'm airing my dirty laundry here, all right? <laughs> it's all the stupid shit that I did. Uh, you've also got first object and last object. Thanks, Jamie, for telling me about that one uh, on any Ember enumerable. So you don't have to use like, any nasty hacks or what I was doing was using underscore JS every time. You don't need it. Uh, Ember CLI also has a bunch of things that uh, you never knew you needed, but now all of a sudden you cannot live without. Um, and for me, that's definitely live reload. Uh, I kind of scoffed at this. You can get it set up for Rails, but it was kind of like, eh, it's not that tough to, to press the refresh button. Oh my god, this is awesome. It makes me feel like a wizard, because by the time I've command tabbed back to my browser, it's refreshed and I can click everything. Ah, it's so cool. Uh, I knew that I'd kind of converted over to this when I found myself staring at a vanilla Rails app and thinking, why the hell isn't it refreshing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the end of our journey. We're in London. This is London from the top. Uh, so thanks very much to Giselle. Uh, and yeah, thanks to Flickr people for the photos. Yeah, questions? Uh, how is the Wi-Fi in the How is it? Uh, actually, in... in uh, in Vietnam, I bought a SIM card for like seven New Zealand dollars with unlimited data for an entire. So seven New Zealand dollars is like three three 50 pounds big. fifty pence. Yeah, 50 and that was not not quite that bad, but yeah, 
and it was free unlimited data and I was sitting there on the train coding away. It was great. It was better than, uh, better than Russia. Can you step back a few slides to your model page where you were looking at the completed title? Uh, scan. That one. The way I would normally do that is put the computed property in the controller because controller really is a view model. Yeah. So, that, so I keep the model clean with the raw data and then if I'm going to replace that with unnamed or something else that's different, put that in the view model so I keep the model clean. Especially if you're using something like Ember Data, you can, you, you're not editing the model, you just post it back and, and its external interface is the same as the data you'll actually post back. Yeah, I mean, Ember Data won't uh, post that back by default. No. So it won't, it looks, if, won't you, if you look at the model, it would look as if it would. Yeah, I think you could definitely make an argument for putting it into, into the controller or the component uh, because it is a display thing. In this case, I'm using it everywhere, so it just sort of made sense to me to put it at the highest level, uh, basically because the only other option would be putting it in a helper and sharing it across, and it just seemed way too complex. But yeah, you're quite right. In general, you probably should put that stuff in the component rather than in the model. Also, I'll just back up uh, two things, which is the get, get, get. Caught out by that, <laughs> I only learned that recently. Uh, and the Ember computed stuff, in the guides, there's loads, yeah. and they're yeah. really powerful, and you can chain them. So something like that, you could do that with computed properties, yeah. by chain, chaining them, yeah, yeah. but then you get into this sort of, like, I've got four extra computed properties on my thing, just to have one thing, but if you've not looked at it, Spend five minutes, it's really great. And there's community uh, supported ones as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Someone's, someone's written a few. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a, a project named uh, Ember CPN. Most of the initiative was made by no I am the maintainer. And it's basically a bunch of useful general groups with the right. properties. And in fact, one of them, one of the main things that uh, has to give to the world is the, the thing that you can actually compose computer properties. So you can have, have and you don't need to create extra keys ah, that you cool. don't care about. You can say something like Ember computed and and inside use an Ember computed or and inside you do an Ember computed default value. Nice. No. What's that called? Ember CLI uh, CPM? No, no, it's not it's Ember CPM. Ember CPM. Oh right, because it's all it model. Stands for Ember computed okay. Man, I seem to run into your stuff on the internet. Yes, it everywhere is. I look. It, does, Miguel. Doesn't, it doesn't use CLI in the middle because it's done yeah, before every CLI was a thing, but it's, it's <laughs> another way. It's pre CLI. It's pre CLI. It's, <laughs> it's ancient history. <laughs> Sweet. Anything else? Or everybody's sick of looking at me already. Yeah. Sorry, can you go back to the slide where you were registering the GPA component? You were uh, watching the, the window resize. Watching the window resize, clean up after yourself. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, no, the next one. This one. Yeah. We'll destroy it. And yeah. Yeah. We'll destroy element and did insert. It's <laughs> it's kind of annoying that those hooks are uh, are not named as two sides of the same coin. Like it should be did insert element or like will uninsert, remove will remove yeah, element or something like this, this, this should be. Oh, first of all problems. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right, that's enough for me. Thanks. All right.